right. Hello and welcome to Adventures in Lollygagging and Friends. Uh, we are playing Call of Cthulhu tonight, and at last we are finally starting, for realsies, uh, our Horror on the Orient Express campaign. Uh, sometime back in 2015, uh, we did our Session Zero, got our characters together, uh, and uh, now we're finally able to start it up. Uh, we're going to be, eh, we're going to be weaving in some other people as the, as the campaign progresses, as schedules permit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but right now tonight we're starting with the four that you see on the screen. Uh, and yeah, we're going to get, uh, we're going to get going. Um, any questions, anybody, y'all, y'all have any, any questions before we get going? I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, uh, I figure we're going to dive in, uh, almost right away and, uh, we'll do character introductions in the game. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Uh, so, uh, Horror on the Orient Express, I should say, a uh, classic campaign. We got the re-released version, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a couple basic things. Uh, we're playing with mostly the original rules, uh, or not original, I said mostly seventh edition normal, but we did bring in a couple pulp things like extra health. They all got one pulp talent and we are using some optional luck rules where they can spend luck to, to sort of, uh, pass, their skill and attribute ratings, things like that. Uh, I can't use it necessarily for like sanity rolls or anything like that. Uh, if you're looking to help out, we're going to do like audience. If audience is going to participate, we'll have little complications as, as we usually do. Uh, and we'll also probably do a little 10% boost to rolls. Uh, I don't know if I want to go all the way to add bonus die, uh, but we'll probably just do a little boost like we do in our Savage Worlds games, things like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I don't really, really, I really don't feel like there's a whole lot more that we have to do. Uh, I will I will say that uh, we're probably not going to get on the Orient Express in this episode. Uh, that's just not how this uh, how the campaign works. It takes a little bit of a lead up to it, uh, but uh, we'll get there. Uh, otherwise, that would be false advertising or something. Uh, but why don't we why don't we get going? Okay, all right. Campaign begins. It is January third, nineteen twenty three. We are in London, uh, just after the New Year. All of you, and I've told you this over the weekend, you're all guests of Professor Julius Smith uh, at the Challenger Foundation's Lecture and Banquet, uh, which uh, is held at the Imperial Institute in Kensington. Uh, Mr. Smith, or Dr. Smith, has been uh, brought in as an honorary speaker. Uh, this is a very formal affair. The hall is filled with these long, elegantly decorated banquet tables and it's attended by notable philosophers and scientists of the day, engineers and inventors, skeptics, academics, all sorts of things. And of course, there are plenty of friends and family that all of these people have brought along as guests, including yourselves. So when we start, the camera is going to start panning around a bit, the room, and we're going to see like glass, we're going to hear the sounds of glass and plateware uh, clinking conversations or kind of vacillating between like these inquisitive moments, these humorous moments, questions or posed answers or debated. Uh, I got designs and equations are scribbled unabashedly on various napkins and discarded invitations. You hear incredulous guffaws and all this laughter start to echo. In the corners of the room, we can even see there's been entertainers that have been set up. They play some subtle tones some music. Uh, perform card tricks here and there and sleight of hands for like a skeptical audience who all seem to relish discovering the, the conceit of the trick. Camera then settles upon the table of Professor Julius Smith, year short of 60. He's dressed in a, in a well-tailored suit, dark. Uh, it's a few seasons behind the current trends, uh, probably more than a few. He's got gray hair. It's kind of slicked back on the sides and a little, little tufts on the top. And you got these waves moving about here and there. Uh, his uh, his face is kind. He's a little worried at the same time, weathered, curious as well. He's got this large curly mustache that's finely waxed and it tapers. He's very, very delicate points. He's periodically fidgeting throughout his hand, kind of slipping into his coat pocket where presumably he has his lecture notes. Uh, but this is done fairly casually. Because his attention is largely largely fixed on, on his table and his guests, which there are several. Uh, but there are two noticeably empty chairs a few seats down on this long banquet uh, onto his right, to which his eyes are periodically shifting before he kind of snaps back to whoever it is that uh, that's leading the current conversation. And so at present, 
uh, as the stage right now is being uh, refreshed for his lecture, is there some stuff that are being moved around, we're going to start meeting the people who are at his table. And so the person that he has been conversing with, uh, let's see, he's been talking, Adam, to Cillian, Bing, is it Cillian Bingura? Yes. Okay, so let me ask you a question. As he turns, as like our, as he's in conversation with you, occasionally kind of fidgeting with his with his jacket, he kind of turns over towards you. You're seated on, you know, towards his left somewhere. What do we see? Who are you? How did you merit an invitation for being here? That kind of thing. My name's Lin Bengur, and uh, I'm a native of Sierra Leone, but I was raised by one of the colonists. So I was raised in that household and um, brought up to speak like them. And I was a friend of his wife's. And so he extended me this invitation because of that. Very nice. And you two have been talking periodically uh, for the past, uh, you know, five, ten minutes in and out of conversation. There's plenty of other people here as well. We hear the sounds of, you know, Waiters, servants, and such moving about, people coming by, refilling carafes or uh, fetching uh, more, you know, heavier drinks and such. What have the two of you been talking about? Uh, his for his wife's sense of humor. She uh, never took anything too seriously, and uh, would never let anyone else take things too seriously either. Mm. Which, uh, given my disposition. I was often the the butt end of her jokes. I see. Uh, and so as you talk and as you kind of reminisce about his wife, uh, he like he you can tell that he's, he's he's really vacillating quite quite frequently between like this sort of downtrodden look to his face. He's just like, yes, yes, Margaret was a oh she was a splendid woman. She put up with me for oh goodness, better part of. I would imagine 35 years we were married. It was uh, it was a wonderful life. Julian, I encourage you. I know your your line of work. And he kind of like stops himself as he starts to go down that path. And I know that your uh, uh, lifestyle uh, is perhaps not one uh, suited for settling down, but I must tell you, uh, my good man, and he reaches out this kind of weathered hand, he kind of claps you on yours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, finding a finding a permanent love that is uh, that is an experience. Oh, I hope all all of my dear friends and my wife's friends can treasure. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, there's still years in this life, I suppose. Indeed. Uh, maybe maybe I will find one. Oh, well, it would please me, please me, uh, in, in unendingly, and I would uh, I would be happy to meet this person and. Uh, and perhaps the next banquet hall, uh, we would have a chair for them as well. Yes, yes. Well, if uh, if I do ever find one, then I will be sure to let you know. <laughs> yes, I would be the uh, most most happy. You would make a an old man uh, quite quite delightful. Uh, so, Cillian, uh, you've uh, you've been sitting next to somebody as well, so right to your left, uh, and kind of sometimes leaning in. Uh, to the conversation, maybe maybe jumping in, popping in here and there, saying this or that. Uh, this is someone you can choose. I want you to you can choose it right now. It's someone you either. Uh, I'm gonna roll randomly. This is my new thing. I just like to roll randomly for folks. Of course, Matt's not here. <laughs> of course, that's you. Of course, that's you again. Okay, <laughs> sitting to your left, uh, and is a is a is a is a man who we'll get a description of in a second. It's Joseph Tidwell. Uh, is this somebody that you met for the first time tonight, Cillian, or is it somebody that you've crossed paths with before? You don't have to say how, just like one or the other. Is it someone you've you just met or someone you've you've met before? Uh, acquaintances, enough to where we recognize each other. But uh, okay. no, I, I don't think that we are good friends. And so as the conversation about about finding a loved one, finding uh, soulmates and such is, is probably a phrase that he ventures at a certain point. Uh, uh, you, you, hear, uh, you hear him kind of clear his throat a bit. Uh, uh, Sergeant Tidwell, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, what about you, uh, my boy? Uh, uh, what, 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 
what say you on this? Uh, you are you a uh, are you accounted for? Do you? Uh, I I I believe I I beg your pardon. I I do not remember. So what do we see, Jeremy, uh, sitting to the left of Cillian at this mm. banquet table? You see Joseph Tidwell, staff sergeant in his uniform. Not that he would normally draw attention to it. He prefers to work in the movies. That's where he got his start. Then he got drafted. That just happens in this day and age. Sometimes you play a cowboy, then you become a cowboy in the Rough Riders. He's wearing his Rough Rider uniform right now. Sir, no. I've never been taken. You can look upon my countenance. You see, Joseph Tidwell has what's called the Innesmore look. His eyes are largely bulged. He looks green behind the ears, as if he should have had gills. There is no hair anywhere upon his body. He is a disgusting-looking human being. However, his uniform that he's worn here, because he's told to wear something nice, and his only nice clothes are his uniform. He is a renowned soldier. He is an ugly, hideous human being. Sir, no sir, there is no woman that would have me. And that's fine, because I wouldn't have time for friends like you if I were taken. Oh, no woman as of yet. You're still a very young man. You have plenty of time to find someone, and, and sir, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'm, you are a personality uh, I would imagine many a young woman would want to spend a lifetime with. Uh, very funny, <laughs> active, very interesting, so many delightful stories you have. Goodness knows, that's what I always say about the ones that look funny. They've got a great personality. <laughs> I see what I mean. So, so very funny. Very hum- very humorous indeed. Indeed. Uh, and so, Joseph, how did you merit an invitation to this affair? Like, how is it you're connected uh, to, to, to Professor Smith? How did you get in, involved in oh, this? I'm kind of surprised an intellectual like him wants to talk with me. It might be that uh, his manservant, Beddoes, and I actually worked together a bit during the war. There was an escort situation. All I can say is at one point, that magnificent bastard had a bullet through his thigh, carried some assistant of his, Cromwell something or other, for seven miles before he fell down. It was amazing. We fought ourselves through a waist-high creek of blood to get his family safe. You hear like a, a clearing of the throat behind you, and you can see Beddoes is kind of standing behind you. Tall man, clean shaven, uh, like extremely clean to the point where his, his chin and his cheeks almost seem shiny. Well-groomed hair. He's him, he himself is wearing a, a very plain tuxedo. He almost matches the staff. And he's, he says, now, now, Mr. Tidwell, you know as well as I, it was five miles. Exaggeration does not become you. I just like a good story. Nonetheless, the man's courage is only matched by his posture. Look at him. A statue. He is very, I I would stand up, but my head will get cut off by the screen. But he is very erect, barrel chested. He's he's probably a man in his 40s. Uh, He's got a very chiseled jaw. Uh, he has the the look of um, he's the look of a soldier to him. You know, he's kind of got these when he when you when he's not attentive, his eyes kind of drift off in, in the distance and such. Uh, he doesn't really, but but his sort of facial expression doesn't really betray anything. And he's very attentive uh, to Doctor Smith. And more than once, he'll he'll fetch him an, another drink, or or uh, he'll kind of make sure that he has everything he needs, whether it's checking in with the the attendants of the. Of the lecture hall, making sure that uh, they they're setting up his his materials properly. Uh, but yeah, he he lingers by and he does sit from time to time as well. He's he actually has become uh, over the years, especially these last four years since the death of uh, Margaret Smith. Um, you know, you know, Professor Smith's probably best best friend in addition to his his sort of his servant and butler and such. Uh, so Joseph Tidwell, uh, I would like to if you can. Could you expand a little bit on your connection uh, to Silly and you two know each other, or at least you know each other to recognize faces. So how did you two meet or, or how, how is it you've come to be able to be familiar with one another? Well, as it were, I was in the movies before I got pulled into the, the great war, as it were. But my true love is the camera. Not that I want to be a star. I like being the set man. I like doing the action. Recently, down in France, they just finished Scaramouche. I'm here for the premiere. We took over a whole village. Lots of stunts. I played 37 different people. I died 36 times on screen. It was amazing. Granted, the men who are there and women during the filming, they need release. And Killian provides the finest services. It's a mental thing sometimes, more so than 
Well, there's the obvious. But Killian's Cecil- just classy. Sicilian, you have been um, professionally engaged with the set of Scaramouche. Is that correct? Well, yes. Uh, companionship takes all forms. and The French are very loving people. I can <laughs> perform all forms. Okay. So then the next thing, Jeremy. Uh, oh, my God. It, they just love you tonight, this uh, random number generator. Oh, my goodness. There we go. Okay. So then Joseph Tidwell. Mm. So sitting, uh, we'll say, kind of across a from the table from you and then to your left, so a few seats down from Professor Smith, uh, there is a woman who has, uh, who has kind of engaged in, in some of the conversation around. Uh, she's not the only one at the table. There's more than just those of you as well, by the way. There's, there's probably a dozen people at this long table. Uh, but uh, periodically you've seen her like kind of speak down the table towards where, uh, towards where Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Smith is. Uh, so it's sort of the same question. Uh, is this a person that you've met for the first time tonight? Uh, or uh, is it a person that you, um, that you have had a run in with before that you've, you've had some sort of previous meeting? Hmm. I'm trying to think of what I know of Pema. She seems like a very lovely lady. I don't know that I've had much reason to run into her. I don't spend a lot of time at museums or intellectual affairs. Fair enough. So this is the first time you've met her tonight. Perfect. Okay. So then let's go ahead and meet Pema. Uh, as uh, as you hear, like, Mr. S- Dr. Smith kind of shout down, Oh, my, uh, my dear Pema. I would imagine you uh, you have had to swat away numerous young gentlemen, uh, would you not? I, that's very kind of you to say, our dear host. I do travel around a bit, um, back and forth between London and Tibet. There just really hasn't been the time. And so uh, seeing Pema, she is uh, kind of darker complected, dark hair, dark eyes. Um, she's wearing a kind of a yellow gown, has some kind of blue accessories to it. Um, and she has been, I've been noticing that she's been having uh, conversations uh, with uh, our host about uh, his late wife, Margaret. Um, Margaret had been um, actively involved with the um, London Zoological Society. Um and uh, we were discussing earlier in the evening that uh, Margaret would have been just elated to see uh, the first woman um, curator at the the zoo. Uh, That happened just a year after Margaret passed, and we would have discussed just uh, how happy she would have been to see that. Oh, yes, yes. Fondness for animals, of course. Fondness for all things. She had a very kind heart, my dear Margaret. Yes. Yes, constantly taking in strays. We never had children of our own, of course. But uh, nieces, nephews, yes, yes. And neighbors, young children and such. Uh, but no, she had a very large heart and many, many, many creatures, both, both people, dogs, cats, pets, anything at all. Yes, anything to fill her heart. Uh, and, and, P- and Pema said, like, you, you met... And you've known Margaret for some time. Uh, okay. Uh, it's probably fair to say that at some point uh, you have crossed paths either directly or indirectly with Cillian then, uh, being also an acquaintance of, of Margaret's in the past. Uh, yes. But um, we don't necessarily have to dive too heavily into that. But we'll say that at, at some point you probably are familiar with one another and you guys can decide that. Uh, now, earlier this evening, this 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 whole banquet has been going on for quite some time, and there's been other speakers. Uh, there's been other uh, people who've been demonstrating inventions, people who have been debunking certain myths, and there have been a few displays here. It's not quite a museum, but there have been displays set up where people have seen kind of these historical models and such of of you know various other uh, very various uh, events in the past or. Kind of a setup of, uh, of of some kind of new uh, new new invention not yet uh, on the market, uh, and you uh, you will say you and Mister Tidwell had some kind of moment like either it was discuss it was discussing this or it was uh, it was in front of one of these uh, one of these displays or it was during a specific lecture. What is it that 
allowed you and Mr. Tidwell to kind of get on? Like, what, what, where is the, where did the conversation blossom from? Uh, I must say, um, Mr. Tidwell, I am fascinated with the occupation of stunt man. This is the just m- movies in general. I'm just not not so familiar with this. I'm very fascinated, though. I am too. That's why I love it. That's why I want to do it. The thing is, cinema is a place where you can take the world that you know and you can turn it into a world that you wish it was. Everybody has a different world in their own eyes, and I I adore it. I, I I've spent so much of my time wanting to get to know the the people and the animals and learning science and getting to know the things that are, and you're, you're devoting your time to things that are not. This is so interesting. I won't lie to you. I spent a lot of time taking care of my horses. If you don't take care of your livestock, your day is doomed. I'm trying to get better about handling the mechanical as well, but my first love will always be my horse. Much to the chagrin of the man over there saying, we're going to find my true love. Oh, well, that Mr. Smith is always, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you are, knew his dear Margaret, uh, but she was quite the matchmaker. And I, I feel like this is maybe a way that he stays connected to her as he's continued on in her uh, her matchmaking, though he is uh, far less subtle than uh, Margaret was. I'm okay with that. I'm not a subtle man myself, but I'm glad he had such a wonderful thing in his life. Important question. Are you a cat person or a dog person? I I actually do have a cat uh, back home. I do too. Mr. Freckles. I love him. I've had him for 15 years. I'm terrified of losing him. Yes, I I, I don't. Uh, I have to say, I, I don't know that own is quite the right word. Um, I would say that perhaps I have been adopted by, um, but she comes and goes as she pleases. Pema, may I call you Pema? Uh, yes, Mr. Tidwell. I like you. I am I am intrigued by you as well. That's the nicest thing anybody said about me the first time they met me. Well, we can we can only go up from here then. Delightful. So, Pema, uh, sitting a few chairs to your right, across the two empty seats that we've mentioned before, uh, is a man that we'll know as we'll know in a moment as Grigori uh, Kozel. Periodically throughout this evening, the two of you have been leaning over these empty seats to continue various conversations, whether it's something as simple as just passing the carafe of water or something else. Um, but whenever the two of you try to shift your seats to try to like hop into that kind of close the gap, you, you, you receive a, a very slight and subtle rebuke, either like a cough from Professor Smith or like a like a stern gaze from Beddoes, um, or even just a slight frown, maybe. Uh, I'm sort of gonna say same same kind of questions for you. Actually, we can let, we can probably just let Chuck handle this then. Uh, Chuck, who is it that we see on the other side of those empty seats from Pema? Uh, so uh, who are you? Gregory Kozel. It is good to meet you all. I've met some of you before. I am a big game hunter, traveled all over the entire lands, killed anything that can be killed, and ran away from the rest. That's quite fun. Charmed. Yes, very charming. I got this big, giant, bushy mustache and these big, giant, bushy eyebrows. It is camouflage while I am hiding in the bush. And... uh how did you merit an invitation to this affair? How did you get into the stable? How do you know? How are you connected to Professor Smith? Uh, he and I go long ways back from time as boys studying. Well, not boys. He was much farther up the class. You, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, my hunting exploits have always earned me a place. It is these tables. That way I can tell my stories to him. He enjoys hearing them. No, oh, yes. Quite I fun. Yes. Very delightful indeed. Very delightful. Well, but you don't kill everything, of course. I, some some creatures you allow a semblance of mercy. Yes, yes, yes. Listen, we've been over this before. Everything at least once. Everything you know, at least once. That's a very interesting policy there, sir. Mm-hmm. Gregory, I would agree to that. 
Ready and also, go. and also, when it comes to hiding in the bush, one doesn't always need camouflage. <laughs> the mustache has many purpose. Yeah. You can see the old man just kind of furrows his brow. Like, I believe there's, there's uh, some ribald humor here at work. Right. Yeah. Still, oh, gives well. you no, a knowing nod. <laughs> and you can see a few other people around here kind of blush a little bit at the sudden sudden shift in conversation at the table. So, uh, Grigori, despite not being really able to shift seats, the two like you and Pima at some point you you sort of were, were able to sort of share some sort of conversation. So, I guess the question is 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 how, what have you been discussing? Is it like a sh- is it some sort of shared interest or activity, or is it like a previous time you met? So, sort of same kind of deal I that I've asked would others. Would imagine if I'm correct, Pima, you said you do much work with museum. Yes, I I spent some time at the London Zoo as a zookeeper, uh, thanks to the good graces of uh, our host's late wife. Uh, and I have my interest in animals, and I feel like maybe you and I have had some conversations this, before. About this is exactly true. Mm-hmm. We've had many conversations about the different things. I've even uh, maybe on occasion uh, managed to bring back is specimens of this or that for study. And the, these are the times when uh, Pema would be um, tolerant of your desire to kill living creatures uh, when it advances scientific study. Very well. It's science. Yes. <laughs> for <laughs> science. For science. So as you... For science, you hear a sudden huzzah from like the table behind you. For science, as uh, a few other relatively drunk scientists and skeptics yes. and academics. If you've ever been to an academic party, they get really plastered really quickly, and everyone's it's it's getting to be a much more livelier time. And it's at this point that one of the event attendees comes over and kind of leans over Professor Smith's shoulder and kind of whispers something uh, into his ear. And so he kind of collects himself. He kind of holds up a hand to all of you really fast, and he says. So, uh, a duty calls, and he flashes this smile that you can barely see the sort of like the yellowing teeth beneath his also bushy but waxed mustache. Uh, I am ever so grateful for your attendance, all of you. Uh, since my dear Margaret's passing, I admit that I have perhaps uh, spent too much time on my studies and not enough time engaging with friends, old and new. Now, if you excuse me. And kind of like fixes his collar a little bit. He stands up. You can see Beddoes comes over and makes sure that his hair looks good and actually fixes the collar that Smith had just accidentally made worse. And then you see, you hear the sound of, of, of like Professor Smith's name being called and you look up and he's being announced from behind a podium. One of the, uh, one of the people of the challenger is kind of, kind of calling out for him. And you hear uh, the voice, Professor Julius Arthur Smith. Lit D, PhD, esteemed lecturer at the University of London, great supporter and patron of the British Museum. Uh, you can hear polite applause, and, and you see Smith kind of start walking up. He goes behind the table, behind you all a little bit. Some of you, he kind of claps on the shoulder and shakes your hand and maybe even like exchanges a kiss with Pema or something, someone else who's willing to do the same. Uh, he kind of goes to a few other tables on his way up. And shakes their hands. A few people he seems to recognize as the classic, oh, yeah, as if they were old friends. And then he kind of ascends the stage, uh, and he 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 kind of gets up there, <clears throat> kind of drinks a couple, uh, like a big old gulp of water, takes a deep breath, kind of looks around. Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed uh, esteemed challenger uh, attendees, uh, colleagues, guests, friends. Uh, and he kind of does this sort of wind up where he just starts thanking specific people here and there. He talks about the rise of like various fields of study, how happy he is to see these different faces, talks about sort of the need for academic scrutiny and peer review, separate charlatans from science and how what they do here is so, so essential to like modern life, so essential uh, to the, the development of science. Uh, he recounts like a few like humorous anecdotes of like, these ridiculous pretenders who kind of aim to beguile people with like parlor tricks and deception. A few people kind of look over at like the little magician guy in the corner and like a couple of the folks that are uh, kind of laughing with great, uh, with great joy. But then 
And I warned you about this, guys. But then his voice uh, grows a bit more serious. And he says, well, <clears throat> there proved to be, however, categories of repetitious phenomenon offering no simple elucidation. And you can see he's kind of going through these note cards now that he has in front of his, and he's kind of flipping over one, flipping around. Uh, I refer to the poltergeist. Uh, to the traveler who suddenly finds himself dozens or thousands of miles or years from where they stood moments before. And you can see his eyes kind of linger. All of you would notice this. They kind of linger right at the seats that are empty uh, on your banquet table. And to the haunting. My, uh, my presentation tonight concerns the last. <clears throat> kind of clears his throat again. I say haunting and not ghost or spirit because alone of such epiphenomena... Haunters can be buildings, lanterns, chariots, swords, and so on, as well as men, women, rats, dogs, bears, processions, even armies. Worldwide, the store of casual anecdotes concerning haunters is enormous. And I say a phenomena because the haunters are not linked with specific observers. And the haunting presumably occurs with or without human witnesses, as we shall see. Thus, perception such an event is secondary to the event itself. The essential characteristics of haunters are simple. And he kind of, you can see he's very professor. He's kind of teaching and lecturing at the same time. But when you look around, half the room is pretty well drunk, but they're all wrapped with attention. Like this is his audience. These are his peers and they are absolutely enamored. Now, whether you all are is a different story. The essential characteristics of haunters are simple. The person all thing must have existed, must have disappeared in some sense, and then must reappear once or many times. The location of the phenomenon may stay the same, or may change. That which reappears may be partial, in insubstantial, or be as solid and real seeming as any member of tonight's illustrious gathering. No conditions are needed. And so here, at this point, he kind of like waves to somebody off stage, and you see an assess and one like one assistant, like these one of these attendees starts to wheel out what looks like a projector. A second one pulls down what looks like a projector screen that had been set up at the back of the stage, and they kind of proceed to control this light projector uh, for Doctor Smith, sort of following his directions. And he starts showing through these different slides three specific hauntings, and they're shown in the sort of discussed in detail: a Breton fishing boat, a Norwegian woman, and a, a London hansom cab. Those are sort of the three things. And he kind of goes through, shows a few pictures of those. He says each incident was studied and photographed simultaneously from at least three positions, allowing accurate scaling of the apparitions. And it gets very academic, very clinical. There are several characteristics shared by each of these hauntings. First, the these apparitions do not coalesce from points, as most tales describe, but slowly emerge whole from invisible planes, as if passing through a series uh, of curtains of perception. And you can see around the room, people are kind of nodding their heads, kind of kicking off to the side. Second, each apparition is semi-transparent. And he kind of goes to this long explanation uh, of what this means, and he walks over towards the screen. He traces this clear, like this, this his line, like a, a line along this clear passage of a wave through the fishing boat, showing that the image like causes like no froth or ripples. Then, uh, then he says, and each uh, each apparition glows appreciably. He starts to explain how his study took great care to isolate the the reflection from nearby objects as they took these photographs, and explains how basically many people in the audience might attribute part of the glow to ionization. But his studies show that this is this is only a small part, he says, kind of scoffing and dismissing them. Next, he starts to discuss the rate at which these apparitions manifested motion and how it was comparable to like these normal, normal movement, how it was slowed by a consistent half. He points to these ripples passing across the sail of the fishing boat. And then he gets the projector operated to start speeding the film up in a very a, a noticeable, appreciable way. And that ripple becomes this fairly normal why the ocean waves in the background become utterly ridiculous. And he does the same thing for the staircase as you see this Norwegian woman descend a staircase. And then this handsome cab where he focuses in specifically on the swaying of this horse's tail and how the how the movement becomes regular, why right? the flying of these flies becomes rapid and manic. And he starts to talk about how historically these apparitions were held, you know, as they, they were sort of held to have disappeared and not even been killed or destroyed. But observation through observation cannot be said is true of every apparition. And he starts kind of getting a little bit morose at the end. He sort of looks down, kind of gets kind of sad, kind of looks over at you all, and he says, 
Uh, one might wait uh, lifetimes for such a chance. And he kind of looks like for a moment he's completely lost his train of thought. And he kind of <clears throat> stumbles a bit, kind of goes through his his car, his drink, takes another drink of water. And then he seems to sort of regain it and starts to sort of speculate a bit. He's like, you know, talking about history of England, how England has been settled for so long. It's only in just the last couple hundred years that all these stories of apparitions started popping up. And, and you see people kind of shout out different examples and stuff, too. And suddenly it's a jovial atmosphere once more. And then he concludes finally by saying that in the past 30 years, science has begun to learn about that which, which cannot be seen or normally sensed, and that some behavior on the atomic level is impossible, even in the greater world. He says, I have come to think that hauntings offer clues to so far indefinable ways of arriving at or opening a way into other dimensions. It is my belief that such hauntings represent clues concerning a natural universe much larger and much stranger than we imagine. The walls of what we perceive as normality have a subtle flexibility. The spectral hauntings I have discussed represent attempts, perhaps random, perhaps purposeful, certainly unsuccessful, to return to this time in space by elements of it somehow removed. Now, if we are energetic, if we are not a little lucky in our observations, students of paraphysicality may one day be able to move up and down time itself, or to travel globally with minor effort, or to perceive lies completely beyond our senses. What waits beyond remains the supreme question which, for the present, each of us must answer for ourselves. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, colleagues, friends, family. Thank you for the invitation to speak. I hope I have provided you uh, some illumination for this evening. And he starts kind of bowing at that point, and projector light goes off. Big old standing ovation, bunch of bows. He starts coming down. He shakes the hands of the projector's assistant, descends the stage, has these short conversations with several people on his way back to your table. And he's kind of continuing to, to sort of weave his way back as everyone's kind of clapping. It's like it's almost like the, the Academy Awards, right? Any of you doing anything before he gets back? Very long, probably 20 minute, 30 minute presentation he just gave. Uh, uh, give a hearty clap and then more drinks. Okay. What more are your drinks. thoughts? What are your thoughts on such matters as I turn to the three of them sitting at the table? I mean, I must say, I don't have any talent for that sort of thing, but I have loved the cinema. I have loved the ability that a camera forces you to see the world through a different eye. And sometimes when you're forced to look at the world in a view different than your own, you do see things that you would not normally perceive. I can't help but believe what he's saying. Well, I, I suppose so. But uh, isn't it also true that although I know nothing of the camera, that I could have an opinion on what I see on the screen? Of course you can. Yes. So saying you know nothing of the sort doesn't mean you can't carry an opinion. Oh, I've got lots of opinions. They're just not very well founded. Mr. Ben? Shidwell, could could it be possible that this was some sort of trick of the cinema? It could be, but I got to tell you, I've messed with changing frame rates, and it's a hell of a thing. Usually, it's consistent. The thing with the tail and the flies. If somebody made that in a trick, they put a lot of work into that trick, because either everything goes fast or everything goes slow. If somebody did that with a trick, I want to know them, and I want to work with them. Changing frame rates. Exactly. Normally you have so many frames per second to create the illusion of movement. Now you can do less frames per second and it's going to make things look fast. Or you can you can switch it up. Uh, uh, I might have it backwards. I'm not the guy who does the editing. But you can tinker with it. It's fascinating. So as your conversation is continuing, as... Smith is trying to work his way back to the banquet table, but kind of getting stopped along the way. People asking clarifying questions. He's meeting with old colleagues and such. All of you go ahead and roll a spot hidden. Let's do our first roll. All of you can do it. Spot hidden? Oh, yes. boy. Spot hidden is the equivalent in this game of awareness, perception, etc. in other games. So normal so difficulty. Close. But if you do better, don't forget you can spend luck. 
You can spend luck if you want to close the gap. So look at what you need and what you rolled, and you can spend the difference in luck to make that a success. Okay, so Pema rolled a 61 and needed a 60. So even though I have hardly any luck, I will spend one. Spend one luck. Just remember that when you, you that if you succeed using luck, you don't get the benefits of advancement, sure. but that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Anybody else pass? No. I was within one. I'm okay, I'll not. spend the one luck. It's okay. fun. So uh, let's see. A couple things I would say. It's just the two of you. Um, okay. Well, I'll say, first of all, as you're talking, I would say both of you would be able to notice, uh, as you kind of periodically look up towards Smith and he's coming back, you see that Beddoes, and maybe this is why you see it, Tidwell, uh, kind of interrupts Smith, kind of intercepts him as he's moving back to the table. Uh, and you can see that Smith sort of steps away from whoever it was he was having the conversation with and Beddoes kind of has something in his hand and he, and he, and he hands this newspaper over to Smith and it's kind of folded up in a particular way. And you can see Smith kind of reads it, reads it, kind of looks up at Beddoes with a kind of quizzical, you know, kind of, kind of quizzical look. And he's kind of as if they're sort of discussing, you can't quite make out what they're saying. Uh, but he seems like there's a sort of a, a concern grows over his face. Um, I would say Grigori and, and Cillian is the two of you are looking around. Uh, most people in the audience, like they had some level of boldness to approach Smith, but there's others. And at one point, uh, as you're looking around, your eyes just kind of happen to kind of look off in this this direction. You see maybe Grigori, especially you, you notice this man because he's probably in his late thirties, darker skin, but he's got this big old bushy mustache and this very dashing suit. And you can see that he's kind of staring at your table, right? just staring at you all. And right as his eyes catch yours, he does like this little start, as if he just didn't realize he mm. was kind of being watched. And he just kind of holds up a hand in apology uh, as, a, as a rudeness. And then he kind of drifts off and walks over towards the direction where everybody is surrounding Smith. Uh, and then I'll say, because uh, since two of you passed, uh, so, Pema, as you're watching as well, um, you can see that n as, as Smith kind of stepped away from where he was conversing with some of his colleagues to read the paper, you can see that right behind him, it's like the corner where some of those uh, entertainers are. And you can see this magician, he's kind of brandishing this top hat, this like really fancy looking top hat. Uh, and he slides this, he picks up from what looks like one of the, one of the plates nearby him or one of the, the sort of serving trays, this two long serving spoon, like very, very long, as long as a forearm. And he just dips it into the hat and it disappears. And you hear like kind of polite clapping and stuff like that. And then you, there's like bickering as like, it almost looks like they're all like those who are in his audience are like, you know, gesturing towards it as if they're explaining how the trick works. You then see him take like this, this this long walking stick from a man who is sitting at that same table, this very, very long, much longer, like four times as long now as the spoon. And he does the exact same thing. It just sort of disappears into the top hat and you are clap, clapping. The man who's, who's, whose cane was taken, he's sort of like, he's very angry now. His walking stick has been, has been taken. And still that conversation continues as people are kind of pointing as if they're, they're, they're revealing the trick. And then suddenly the, the street magician almost when this like sense of like, Frustration, you see, brandishes his arm and it just dips his arm into the top hat. And then when he goes to pull it free, his arm is not there, but rather it's just a stub covered with a jacket sleeve of a tuxedo pinned and curled underneath the stub and silence by his little audience right behind Smith. You can see it kind of framed in the background and foreground. And he does the second one. He kind of brandishes it with his arm, hands it over to a woman who's sitting right in front. And he kind of does the same thing, lifts his arm up, his, le his, his left arm up and dips it down in. And when he pulls it back out, he's now, all he has are these two small stubs of arms. Like both of them kind of curled up as if they've had the sleeves folded over top. And everyone at the table just starts clapping and like dumbfounded looks. And there's no longer are they like trying to like explain it. And then he does like this bow and then he goes whoosh, like that. And his arms are suddenly there once more and clapping and laughter and people are up and sort of being very jovial. And one of them bumps into Smith, who goes stumbling into one of the tables, knocks over like some glasses of wine and kind of gets up. Oh, very sorry, very sorry. And he looks just completely, completely discombobulated. After a few minutes, he comes back. 
You can see he's got a stain on his shirt. And he kind of sits down and he looks exhausted. <sighs> Reaches out, grabs this big old glass of water and just drinks it. Let me say, good show. Oh, um, thank you very much, Mr. Bingara. I, uh, <clears throat> I worked on that for, uh, for quite some time. Yes. I thought I got a little, um, little loose in the middle there. My mind wandered a bit distracted. Yes, yes. Hmm. Ah, oh, yes. Um, he kind of looks around, looking for Bedos. He's no longer there anymore. And he just... <laughs> yeah. I must say, uh, if you all uh, <clears throat> wouldn't mind, um, they are closing down the banquet hall, but they've afforded me some time to collect my thoughts and speak with uh, some extras. <sighs> Could I uh, entice you all to remain here? Uh, just for a, a bit of time, I, I have a um, delicate conversation I would need to discuss with you all. This is fine. Yes, I have no need to be. You may deal with what you need to in the meantime. So you have my undivided attention. Uh, yes, absolutely. You, you, you did marvelously, by the way, just uh, in case oh, anyone oh. hadn't told you, though I'm sure you've heard that many times before you... Uh, Came back to our table. Uh, young Pima, you are being far too, uh, too much flattery. Flattery does not pursue you. No, no, no. If I ever, if I ever stuck my foot in my mouth or if I ever jabbered on for too long, Margaret would be very sure to tell me. And if you are to be friends of mine still, then I should expect truth and honesty from all of you. Yes? Nothing but. How was it then? Be honest. Did I, I sound as truth. old and mindless as I felt up there? It was very entertaining. You were right. I did catch the moments where you drifted in the middle a little. What I was is probably it that, clueless. This. No, we did you, have... Mr. Kozo, thank you, thank you, thank you. You, this, you had what? Questions? Well, we had quite a... No, not so much at the moment. I would be quite happy to go over my notes with you if you like. If there's yeah. more information you'd like to... I did cut down about 15 minutes from the speech. I could give you an extra now, if you like. Yeah. Maybe not at this moment, but there was much conversation had about your footage and the, the perspective and speeds of the things moving. It was quite, quite special to see. Nothing I've seen like before. Oh, yes. 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 I must say I was not... Extremely, I, I wasn't able to follow it as very, very well, but I did. I did notice that during everything going on, particularly when people get um, up and about, I find that I am a, one could say a challenger enthusiast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I would be more than happy, uh, Mister Binger, at any time while you're remaining in London to a. Uh, so walk through the finer details if you're interested, and if you would like to see the footage uh, in its raw state, uh, I would be more than happy to share that with you, Mr. Tidwell, Mr. Kozel. Uh, none of it has been doctored in any way whatsoever. I have a reputation to maintain, skeptic, of course. If I were to do such a thing, I would, well, I would not be getting invitations to events like these, now would I? It's true. Yes. Very true. You guys hear this sound of this woman just cackling with laughter from like right behind uh, where you're sitting. You look over and you can see at the table, everyone's kind of getting up and they're on their way. Everyone's sort of leaving, getting their coats, you know, like attendees are, are, are kind of retrieving based on tickets and things like that. And you see this woman just cackling with laughter. Gorgeous woman. Her hair is done up beautifully. And she's got this like pearl necklace. It's just sort of she's sort of like tangling with it. She's looking down at, at, the, at the table and you can see like there's these little like like almost um, like uh, like clockwork little little animals like moving about like these little tiny machines. You see like a frog that's just sort of like doing this like suddenly hopping forward and you can even hear the and then it hops hops and you see this other little rat kind of moving around all of it sort of mechanical and says, oh, so very delightful they think of anything these days how quite amazing you are truly a fabulous individual this is a delightful conversation so she's got like in one hand she's got she's playing around the pearls the other she's got this wine glass and as she's as she's 
talking around. She's confusing the two, and she starts sloshing around. The wine just flops up in the air, and you can see the attendees are all kind of scrambling to clean up after her. After a little bit of time, you can see the hall begins to get emptier and emptier. Conversations dwindle. Eventually, eventually it looks like you don't necessarily have the whole hall to yourself, but you can see they've left you there. Uh, the, there are attendees, there are workers that are kind of breaking stuff down, but you all are basically the only, uh, the only guest left. Even the people at your own table, others that we didn't necessarily meet, they've already left. And like Dr. Smith, he like lets out this, this, this big breath and he kind of reaches into his, his coat pocket and he pulls out this, this tin of tobacco and kind of, kind of hands it over to, to Mr. Tidwell and Mr. Bingura. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, very... I'll never turn you down on a smoke. Of course. So it's this foul kind of like obsidian hued, uh, it's called Balkan Sobrani. It's like little chewing tobacco. I'm not sure if you all know anything about it, but he kind of dips down there. It's a terrible habit. Margaret was very cross with me and I could never do it inside the household. I suppose it's one of the benefits of her not being here, as I can do this wherever I want. However, no, I, I suppose I still don't chew in the household now, do I? Hmm. Anyhow, uh, and so Pema will yourself. actually pull out, you know, sort of the the like cigarette holders, mm. um, and nice. she'll. Uh, while I, I, I don't partake, w- would you mind if I uh, light up? Oh, of course, my dear. So, and so she'll sit there with kind of one of those long hmm. holders. Nice. And then he, he kind of leans back to bed. He's like, Better see if you can round up some brandy for my, my, my fellows here. And then he kind of turns to you all. He's like, I hope uh, you believe me when I tell you that uh, my invitations to all of you were uh, out of a genuine desire for your company. Uh, but circumstances dictate that I, I must now ask you for a favor. I'm good with this. We were old friends. I help as much as I can, my friend. Thank you, Mr. Coase. Thank you, Mr. Coase. Now, I will say I I certainly hope your particular set of skills uh, hunting animals will not be needed. Uh, But um, you are a very astute man, much my junior, and I'm sure you are capable of uh, of tact. I suppose hunting is part of this now that I think about it, but uh, not quite in the way you're used to, I'd imagine. Uh, You say... As you no doubt observed, our party was missing two of its members this evening. My friend, Mr. Henry Stanley, who I've known for several years, by way of our mutual membership in the London Train Spotters Association, and who I have employed on numerous occasions to assist in my research, primarily as a procurer of items both historical and, some might say, arcane. And then there's Mr. Reginald Abernathy, who I have corresponded with in recent years on many topics including related to some of the research I presented this evening. Now, neither men made their absences known to me. In fact, both accepted their invitations with great excitement for this uh, this event. And while their lack of attendance is disappointing, of course, my initial annoyance has now been replaced with concern. Bettos, if you... Bettos, uh, where is that blasted man? It's fetching brandy. He'll yeah. return. Of course, of course. And then he kind of, oh, no, I have. And he kind of reaches into his jacket and he pulls out that rolled up paper. And he kind of passes it and kind of first goes over to like Bangura and like you and Tidwell can do it. And you can probably shift seats at this point so all you can see it. And what you see is a copy of the Evening Standard from just several hours ago. I think it was just released several hours ago. And there are a variety of, um, variety of stories but the one thing that he kind of reaches his, his kind of weathered old finger out towards and he points down to, you can see that it is a, uh, it almost reads a little bit like a tabloid. If you want to think about it in those terms, it's not like a full on, uh, it's not like a full on national Enquirer, but it's, it's sort of similar. Uh, and it says, uh, it says man disappears in cloud of smoke. Spontaneous human combustion, question mark. And then you start reading the, the, the newspaper. It's police are today investigating the disappearance of Mr. Henry Stanley, 41, of Stoke, Newington, 
who was reported missing last night by his landlady, uh, Mrs. Constant Atkins. She alleges that she heard a cry from Mr. Stanley's upstairs room at 8 o'clock. He did not answer her knocking, and when, when she opened the door, the room was full of smoke and there was no sign of him. Mr. Stanley is not married. He is a noted train enthusiast, member of the London Transporters Association, etc., etc., etc. And so... You see, at one point, there's like this, this paragraph. It's like, his disappearance may be a case of spontaneous human combustion. Police have refused to comment on this. Similar cases have been reported in England earlier this century. The most recent, uh, the most recent known was that of Mr. J. Temple Thurston, who burned to death in his home in Dartford, Kent in 1919. And then kind of keeps going and going and going. And so hmm. as you're kind of, as you're reading it, it's like, you're like, well, as you can see, my good friend... Uh, Miss Henry Stanley has gotten himself into a bit of trouble. It is... Yeah, I mean... So... The thing says he's, he's self-immolated. Yes, yes, yes. Um... Well, you know how things are, Mr. Kozel. Sometimes these rags, they help publish anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose it's certainly possible. Spontaneous combustion has some credence to the possibility. Science is still murky at best. However, whether whether it's his self-immolation or whether it's some other nefarious uh, nefarious result, the, the end result is the same, that my friend seems to have gone missing. Men who I have known for several years, who was in my employ, and who was meant to be here this evening. And he was very excited to. He, uh, our last correspondence, uh, he had sort of exhibited a great deal of excitement, not just for uh, my lecture, but also that he had stumbled upon uh, some new find that he wanted to share with me. Uh, something from the old Alexis family possessions, and he said it looked quite promising. He seemed very, very exuberant. And, uh, well, I'm afraid perhaps sometimes in his line of work he might cross the wrong person, acquire the wrong item, that sort of thing. I assume you were asking this of us, that we, we might uh, pull our knowledge and interest together and provide some assistance that uh, you don't believe you could get from the local authorities. Yes, well, that is fair. Uh, I... Uh, and as you mentioned, the local authorities, he, uh, well, Bedos and I, we, um, let me just put it this way. The few contacts within the, the police that we did have are a bit cross with us currently, entirely separate issue, uh, but, um, perhaps some of your own tactics might work instead, uh, especially those of you who are not uh, entirely familiar with the local constabulary. Now, uh, Anybody who wants, by the way, can roll an occult test if you like. No. I'm not even going right. to bother rolling it. Call. I tried. You can always you roll it. You percent might yeah, okay. come. Yeah, you can always it. roll it. And maybe you roll a seven and you spend two luck. It's what? Wow. <laughs> Did you make it? I you did. Made it. <laughs> Okay. All right. So you need a uh, five. Rolled a three. I had a five percent chance. This this seems familiar. A few <laughs> dice, good rolls. Yeah, I was. Right? I did That's come from the place right there. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah, just low percentage is gonna hit. Okay. And so Cillian it looks like it. it looks like Cillian and Joseph both got, both got this. Okay. So you heard him in his explanation mention the Alexis family. Uh, it is a. There's a name that the two of you would recognize. You can, you know, kind of explain how you might have stumbled across it. But basically, um, the name Randolph Alexis is a is a was a a well known occultist of some notoriety, but decades ago, nothing recent. He had links to like these two fraternal orders that are kind of bandied about sometimes in certain circles: the the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight. Um, both of which I would say you would have vague knowledge of. They're not really operating in London these days, but uh, but the names uh, you know it, it is frequently associated in their in their, in their sort of the, the books about this man. Uh, he also had a son uh, by the name of, of Albert Alexis, and um, they both apparently shared 
uh, this kind of interest in like these dark arts, occults, and things like that. Now, much of much of Professor Smith's work is like debunking this kind of stuff. Like, and even to some degree, like his his speech tonight was about bringing scientific scrutiny to magic, basically to magical concepts, ghosts, and traveling, and all that kind of stuff. So, like, he's very much willing to believe in certain things so long as it can be scrutinized and supported and peer reviewed and all that kind of thing. So you two would probably both also know that both father and son met very unfortunate ends. Uh, Randolph died in a train derailment uh, back almost 26 years ago, 1897, Liverpool. Uh, Alexis, he disappeared, um, or Albert, I should say, disappeared from his home in 1917, six years ago. And he's believed, uh, the rumors were that he was believed to have been murdered by unknown persons. All that was found, uh, you would both know, uh, it was a few drops of, of dried blood in a smoke-filled room. And authorities concluded that the assassins uh, had basically tried to burn the house down to kind of conceal their crime. Uh, no body was discovered. Uh, but that is the, that is the name uh, that he, he just casually drops as uh, Henry Stanley having acquired items from the Alexis family that he was mm. very excited about. Yes, I... I have known someone of the Alexis family before. Hmm. I think it's tragedies. Me. Funny you mentioned the smoke and the, the thought of immolation, because there was something about the uh, the sun. Their end, having similar yes. trappings. Yes, 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 yes. I have uh, I've heard those tales as well, indeed. Yeah, yes, uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, they were presuming it was a manner of cover-up for a crime uh, but now that you mention it yes yes uh, Henry Stanley goes up in smoke and as does uh, Albert Alexis very interesting coincidence perhaps not with it man what's your theory and he kind of leans forward towards you uh, Tidwell well I'd like to say I'm not an incredibly intelligent man but I usually like to think that the simplest path is most likely I think we're dealing with people that have both run into strange situations Likely dealing with things that somebody doesn't want them to mess with. Kind of leans over and gives you kind of a meek slap on the shoulder. Oh, man. You're far more intelligent than you were than you appear. Or at least that you give yourself credit for. I don't know. Excellent, excellent theory. Hypothesis there. Well formed. Occam's razor. Indeed, indeed. Yes. Um, so, I am, uh, as you can tell... I'm getting up in the years, my my investigative days are usually uh, spent and died inside of a library or uh, perusing various documents in my office. I haven't the the knees, the stamina, the constitution to wander around and ask questions of people who probably do not want the answer. And hmm. most of my work, I hire folks like Stanley and you know, or Beto's even or. This Mr. Abernathy fellow as well to, to handle some of these things, and I am hoping that uh, four of you would be willing to take on this task. And Pema's going to kind of like elbow um, Mr. Kozel next to her and just say, "It, it sounds like a hunt." But it it's, does. It's in the town, though. It's not. It's not out in the great wide open. The urban jungle is no less fearsome. Some would even say the most dangerous game is in town. Oh, it is. I will not argue with that one bit. So, this conversation continues, and he just basically he provides you some basic information. This is where Mister Stanley lives. This is his home, et cetera, et cetera. Name of his his landlady. He's never visited there himself. Mister Stanley usually came to him, uh, but he's he's heard the name. She's a very curious woman. Uh, he he kind of describes her as. Um, he references this specific, uh, you know, police station where like, you know, this is likely within the neighborhood and that kind of thing. Uh, and he leaves you a newspaper if you would like it. Uh, and then he kind of gets up at last. You see him kind of wobble a bit as the drink and just getting up too quickly. And just the night is very late at this point. This conversation has essentially closed down the banquet hall. And he says, well, if there's nothing more, my friends, I shall be at, uh, at university tomorrow. Friday as well, so today's Wednesday. But I am, uh, uh, if you need me, uh, 
Call on Beddoes, and I'm sure he can find me. You know my address, you know where I live, you know my offices. I'm, I'm grateful for the time uh, that you're willing to give to this. Very well. Mm. Glad mm. to be assist. We'll Thank look you. around for Beddoes and make sure that he's got assistance. He's there. Oh, oh, Beddoes is like right next to him. Like the guy is super, you know, you know super, uh, super quick to kind of grab an arm, make sure the man's kind of held. And he kind of start wandering out. And like at this point, you all start venturing out as well. And the night is is essentially done now. When you, by the time you leave the hall, you're you're if you look at the map, I think the map should be working. You guys are on the London map, right? Mm-hmm. Probably should have told mm-hmm. you. This. Yes. You're over here in Kensington, so I just ping it on you all the way to the west, over by south of Hyde Park there. So that's uh, essentially where you all have been, the Imperial Institute. Uh, so it's late. Um, I'm sure all of you have places that you're staying already uh, accounted for. You've again. So I was saying to you before, you guys were already in London for your for your own devices. And so they, I would say as you all start to retire to your various places, uh, I wonder if we could just do like a quick transition. Like where or what kind of place are you staying at? Is there anything you're doing late at night? Anything you're going to kind of show us about your room or your possessions or your your practices or something like that? Or a little tidbit, something like that. And, and also, do you all uh, agree to, to meet in the morning or do you set off a plan or anything like that for the for the next day? Yeah. I've got to tell you what I would love to... Oh, you first, you're Mr. Not, Kozel. You will say it faster than I will. Please start. So I've got an idea. Number one, I like to cross-reference things. Like, if you got an idea of this and that, we have this guy. We know he's studying something. I'd love if we could maybe use the friendly connections to see if he's got any sort of journal, things he was looking at. And then we try to cross-reference. If we can find the other guy who disappeared with the smoke, we see if we can look at what he was, like, writing about at the time just before he disappeared. We cross-reference to those two pieces of information. Where they meet up, that's probably what we need to focus on. Yes, I think that is highly uh, efficient way to handle this hunt. Sounds like quite the scientific method. So, I just saw it in a, at, like a film I worked on before. Fair I'm just enough. copying people that are smarter than me. Watching Some... being watching film sounds a lot like reading a book. You get to know about different things that you haven't actually done yourself. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Fair. So, where is it in morning that we meet? Hmm. Don't we worry, have our- trying to name a specific place. You don't. You're not required yeah. to know London geography yeah. from 1923. Yeah. Just a no, general that's, idea. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, what are two things? The, we've got two. Uh, you mentioned two vantage points to approach. One I know is the apartment where man supposedly burned. That would be worthwhile seeing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is the other that you mentioned? You talked about the person who, uh, yeah, the one who went going from that family. Uh, there was the gentleman, the son. He went missing. I forget exactly how many years back. Sometime back, if we could try and uh, we could look that up. Maybe we even uh, uh, try to press if anybody has connection to, uh, 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 well, I think it was called a Golden Dawn. I may have it wrong. I don't think they're very even very active anymore. Or or even a, a local newspaper, perhaps more uh, articles mm. about uh, 1917 when Albert went missing. We'll visit the, the library, desert. see what they have there. That's a great point. Very well. Well, I think that it would be more pressing to visit the place where the crime supposedly happened simply because time is of essence when it comes to finding trail. It's like it's like starting from the beginning, I imagine, and finding the scent. Exactly it is. Exactly it is. So, tomorrow morning, we will meet for breakfast at Takes wherever ends. place. I'm, and, staying, uh, I'm staying near there. I have a flat. Well, I suppose we, we should meet up in the, in the morning. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, Perhaps if we could share breakfast together, we could uh, uh, put our heads together a little bit more. I think this is true. Yeah, lovely idea. I think after libations, uh, perhaps uh, I'm a bit lost in the details. That is fair. Very well. We meet morning at whatever restaurant for breakfast, and then we visit the place the burning happens. Okay, so we'll say night ends with you sort of like all going off in your different directions, getting your 
taxis or such, kind of finding your way back to your homes, your hotels, wherever it is that you're staying. Uh, is anyone doing anything else in addition to that? Uh, or do we want to just fast forward to morning? Uh, I would not be, no. Rest, okay. making sure I'm ready for the next day. All right. So we'll say, we'll kind of fast forward through that. And we'll say we wake up, uh, or at least the kind of fade out. We open up. You guys have been eating breakfast, paying the tab, talking about whatever you've been talking about. Uh, and what is the plan for the day? Are you are you doing what like what Koza was saying? You're just going to go to Stanley's uh, Stanley's place, or is or did people have other ideas? I mean, breakfast, of course, because Cillian said we should get breakfast Already first. Done. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, after that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, if you all want to go to Stanley's home, that's fine. Uh, you you basically have the uh, you have the address. It was, it was given to you by. Uh, by old uh, Dr. Smith. So you head on over. Uh, it's not that far away. Uh, you can a get there. Quick Rel- question on this. Yeah, man. So we have home, but he also told us about the landlady who is a peculiar character. Do we have any additional information on her? So what you would know is that the, um, so Stanley's, he basically lives in like a one room, uh, one room apartment, basically. I think it's called like a bed sit the name i think they refer to it as which effectively is just like she's like runs the the building and there's all sorts of like rooms that she lets out is essentially what it is uh and all that all that was referenced that you had have uh is just whatever stanley had said to smith of her just being kind of an odd lady that's it like kind of an offhand nothing okay. uh, nothing more serious than that or, or do we have a location that. for her so if we wanted to same place speak- same place. Good. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. So she would, she would basically be on, you know, on site uh, and then she would probably have tenants somewhere else in the building. We might need to speak with her first to get access. Unless okay. we want to break and enter and then <laughs> this is always a possibility. Well, I, I don't believe in breaking the law before you at least try to do things a legal way. Very well. Let's just go speak to strange landlady. So you head over to Stoke Newington, uh, and there's an apartment building. And as you all arrive, uh, we don't need to really hem and haw over how, uh, you arrive, you notice, well, there's the first thing you notice is a large chalk sign has been set up on the sidewalk. We'll say it's, you woke up, you're probably out pretty late, so maybe got a little bit of a late start, had breakfast and traveled over. It's nearing noon, but not quite. And you see that there is a large chalk sign that has been set up on the sidewalk. And it says, see the death room and then six pence. And then you see in the window, uh, like in another smaller handwritten sign, uh, it says room to let uh, right in there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That makes things a bit easier. I suppose there's no need for subterfuge then. Oh, no, she certainly but, did not waste any time. I mean, he she, was missing. I thought that was the presumption, not that. This is what I believe Dr. Smith said. It's, but maybe he was only missing to Dr. Smith and not the rest of London at large. I see. I see. Well, maybe but, she bought it in the self-emulation thing. And if so, she wants new rent soon. Oh, yes, yes. That could be he is just missing and she faked this self-burning to fuel her you know i i'm even more simple than that i think she just sincerely believes that this man is burned and gone and she wants more money she's not gonna make money if nobody's renting that room that is true that is true and everyone loves spectacle it it would appear that they do i am curious if she will charge us expense to go into the room i'm sure she will well we can make sure of it as I walk inside, yeah, go inside. Yeah, you guys see a, a large sitting room opening up, and off to the side, there is a, another door that kind of seems to open up to uh, open up to a, a small, like not actually a fairly large apartment downstairs, connected to the sitting room. There's stairs going up to a, a higher levels in the flat. And as the door opens, you hear a little ding, as there's a bell over top of the door, and then you hear the sudden as like 
feet sliding across or dragging across the floor come come waddling out and you see a woman that you would probably put in her 50s. She has her curlers in, her hair curlers are in for sure. She has a nightgown on, uh, dressing gown, I should say, excuse me. Uh, she got a cigarette kind of hanging out of her mouth, uh, which she uh, she quickly puts down. And then she says, okay, one second, please. If all of you are going upstairs with six pence per person, uh, no freeloading here. You want to see the death room, I presume? It's been busy all morning, of course. Hello, hello, yes. Um, I, for once, would like to see the death room. Six as pence. I, as I put my six pence on the, on the counter. The match, yes. She looks over with great uh, severity, uh, kind of towards uh, towards Joseph and Pima or Pema. Excuse me. Give me just a second here. It takes me a little bit. To, I was I've been spending so much time in France. I gotta make sure to work out the exchange rate here. I've got uh, got. Uh, it, don't worry, I got you too. I'll put down another twelve. Twelve. Uh, oh. wow. One, I very nice. Very much enjoying six, seeing the for me the home of a dead man. Six is six. Yes, hmm. we're all oh. paid. Indeed. Well, how very kind of you. Now, uh, this way, if that's what you list. Uh, no refreshments or anything. No, no drinks or things or such as that. We haven't quite figured out some sort of grandier thing to do. And I was very, very sad thing, of course. Poor, poor Mister Stanley, burnt to a crisp. He was. Yeah. Uh, kind of starts going upstairs. You hear th- 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 were the two I mean, of you close? Close. Well, I knew Mr. Stanley could be a very curious man. Lonely, I could tell you, of course. He lived alone. Very old man. Very childlike. Not very mature. Not surprising. Doesn't have a, have a, have a lady in his life. Uh, I say he was so very excited about the first strangest of things. Just the other night, he'd come home. Four o'clock or so with his friend, the other one. Uh, very excited. Had some tea, but he was all, all aghast about this, uh, this toy train set he acquired. Can you can you believe it? A, a grown man getting so excited about a train set. It's absolutely ludicrous. And uh, anyhow, here we are. And he kind of, she kind of, kind of comes up and she got the she got the key. The other oh, one. Oh yes, they didn't put that in the paper. There were two men went up and smoked, in fact. But they didn't believe me that there was a second. Yes. The cops thought I was delusion. That I wasn't a trustworthy witness, of course. Mm. But no, there did was it, a second. Did this one have anything notable about him? Was he equally lonely, it seems? Or? Oh, they were fast friends, apparently, talking all sorts of things. Yes. What's, oh. What sorts of things? Oh, well, when I got close, they would hush up all nice and quickly at that. Mm. And I would ask sorts of questions, and I'm just, you know, curious woman. Well, they surely, don't like that, young men mm-hmm. as they are. Surely some things could be heard through walls. Oh, well. Is it not? Mostly they were just talking about the, the shop they had come from, the wonderful finds, some sort of mumbo jumbo, some such, yes. And then they were just looking around at that little device, and the two of them, heavy as it was, had to carry it up to them. They even even looked at me for a moment as if they were going to ask me, me of all people, an elderly lady such as myself, getting my hands dirty, helping them carry up a train set. Are you kidding? Elderly? You don't look a day over 40. Roll charm test. (laughs) 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 Uh, where is that located? Uh, there it is. There it is. Found it. You got it. <laughs> it should be like I think it's alphabetical, ish. Oh, hey. how'd you do? I'm not really looking at the screen, so just I got it. a 44 <laughs> out of 70. Okay, nice. Oh, <laughs> just kind of blushes, <coughs> coughs because she was smoking a second ago. Someone of my particular stature would know a thing or two about being able to hear things through walls. And she gets even redder at that point. <laughs> oh, sir, well, we do not do that sort of thing here. Not at this place, not if I have anything to say about it. Now, this is a reputable 
wonderful establishment. But you can tell as she's saying that she's sort of eyeing you up and down. Mm. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. And she's just like, kind of like, she's got like the the, the top of her, her dressing gown there. And she's just, it's very hot in here this evening. It's, it's very warm for January, don't you think? Yes. Uh, well, I... I would agree. Uh, to be fair, uh, Mr... As she speaks to, to Cillian. Bangor. Bangor, how very exotic that is. Yes, yes. I am, I, I'm, I'm Mrs. Atkins. Well, Mrs. No More, he's been dead for 15 years, of course. No, no, I've been all on my own all this time. And she kind of just leans against the wall that's, at this point. That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you are such a flatterer, sir. Well, truth be told, they did not want me near their conversation. Tea is mm. all they wanted. Yeah. They shame. were talking about some sort of um, lecture hall, ball, something or other, and how um, a man, I forget his name, very old, uh, Mr. Stanley's mentioned him before, they would be so very excited to hear about this, um, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not. I, I can't be much more help than that. If, if you want to see uh, the train said the the, the the police took it there, they they, they give uh, the the room a very a very very careful once over. They said, and well, honestly, that was the only item they found of any curiosity because it was electrical, and they thought perhaps the spark might uh, might have caused it. Uh, I would be surprised if such, but I don't know anything about such things, of course. But other than that, the room was exactly as it was. So. And there was nothing else out of place. Oh, well, surely, surely, someone of your astute observation skills would notice something. Oh, sir, of course you are. You are very. Uh, thank you very much for this. I am not used to hearing such kindness coming. You from... You do have an eye for detail. As I motion towards whatever she's <laughs> like decorated this place, yeah. and it doesn't matter. <laughs> there's like there's like sconces, but they're slightly <laughs> askew. Like it's not a very nice place. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, those those have been here for quite some time. My mother picked them out many years ago. Yeah. Well, if you must have, yes, of course. I will tell you a very, very similar story. I told the policeman who came by, and, and Mister Stanley came home with his friend. Um, what was his name, Mister um, Abernathy? I think it was. And yeah, and they were here for four o'clock for tea, down in the sitting room, of course, and and that's where they were all exuberant and excited, of course. And he went upstairs uh, with Mister Abernathy around seven, I believe, and I never saw. Mrs. Stanley again, and uh, I remained in the sitting room as I normally do in the evening. I was reading, and uh, if Mrs. Stanley had left, I would have seen him. Well, mm -hmm. short while later, I heard I heard a cry, a start, you might say, and and then there was a very strange rumble. The walls, the uh, ceiling, floor, very, very, very as if it shook. It was very alarming, sir. I was, I was, I was quite terrified, but. Terrified as I was, I must be very protective of my uh, uh, my people. Uh, and she like walks over as you're on the second floor. And there's like this little bookcase, and she pulls off like a little photo book, and she's kind of showing you the different people she has. It's like I am, uh, I am like a mother to them. I am uh, mother hen. I make sure none of them are harmed. And so I rushed upstairs to check on him. I knocked on the door, but no answer. As as any responsible person would, of course. Now, yes. I, I I have a key, but I try not to use it. Privacy is very important. But I opened. And he was gone. He was not there, but the room was filled with smoke. And when I say filled, Mr. Bengar, I don't mean just a small wafting from a single cigarette sitting in a, in a tray nearby. I mean a forge. Smoke everywhere. I could barely see. I mm. coughed for days. I've been washing my other dressing gown. Ever since, I can't get the stench out. You mentioned well, earlier something about the train set? Yes, indeed, sir. And now there's the stench of smoke? That is correct, yes. It, did okay. Did you happen to know if the, if the two gentlemen were part of the uh, locomotive society together? I believe there is such a... Well, I believe Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Stanley did say something about um, Train Spotters Association, I believe. Yes, mm. yes, yes, that. 
I am not sure about the other one. He was very, um, very private. Didn't care to share many details. As if he hasn't quite decided who he wants to be yet. Indeed. Well then, now, I don't mean to be morose, but, um, I'm quite certain they have been burned to a crisp. Well, considering the smoke, I don't see how anyone could possibly survive. However, I can't imagine where on earth a body would have gone. Very peculiar, of course. The newspaper reporters were here as well. Some of them quicker than the police. Anyhow, she like turns the key and put. Go ahead, yeah. Good. I have heard of such rumors, such things as spontaneous combustion. Spontaneous combustion. Oh, yes, one of the reporters mentioned that. How very curious indeed. Now, in the yes. one for schooling, however. Uh, well, there's been all sorts of uh, rumors and accusations as to what could be causing it, but uh, uh, the most ridiculous and frivolous one I've heard is drinking too much tonic. <laughs> if drinking too much tonic could make you turn into a puff of smoke, I would have been a rolling smoke-filled room years ago, sir. And she pushes the door open. Here it is, death room. Take a gander. You have, you've paid, so you have... She, like, looks over at Mr. Bingara. 30 minutes. And she gives you a wink. Of course. Thank you. You're too kind. And so the doors open. You step in. It's a very small one-bedroom, uh, dark floral carpet. It's pretty standard. Uh, all any of you have been in a big city, especially London, Standard cold water, bed sitting room, lonely people habit mm-hmm. these things everywhere, etc. Uh, there's a door on the east wall that you just came in, the window on the west wall. And the you know, you notice as you as you look around, the room's filled with books and pictures of trains and engines, railways, various rail projects, things like that, all manner of things. Um, and you do smell as you walk in here. It smells like smoke in here. Is there yeah. Any kind of clarification on the kind of smoke, like the smoke of just the wood burning is one thing. The smoke of meat cooking is another thing. That's a great Smokes point. caused by chemicals. Uh, roll an intelligence test. So in times five, uh, let's say. So yes, let's that distinguish is, that. Just, uh, let's see, intelligence. I click on the button. I think this is right. Yeah, look at that. That's the uh, 20 under 60. And it counts okay. two little stars. It's a hard success. Uh, yeah. You would be able to distinguish it. In your, you have a very uh, advanced olfactory gland from the time out in the bush, I would imagine. Uh, mm. It is certainly not the smell of, of cooking meat, nor is it the smell of cigarette smoke or cigar smoke or any tobacco product that you've ever smelled. No, in fact, it smells actually... Like the smell of perhaps burning coal? Hmm. That is that is kind of following along with the thoughts that I have. I'll start looking around. I want to give other people opportunity to investigate too. Sure. But there's other things I will ask about later. So Pema is going to um, kind of take out the uh, kind of cigarette holder that you saw her with yesterday evening. And she's going to kind of walk around the exterior of the room and she's kind of tapping on the walls. So she's kind of thinking like someone disappears in a room. There's some sort of trickery going on. And so she's just kind of tapping. Tap all the walls. You don't notice any like hollow areas to suggest a hidden compartment. But one thing you do notice on the walls is that the wallpaper, there are bubbles underneath it. As if it's been steamed, like you see bubbles everywhere as you're tapping along and tapping along. And so Petma will just sort of look around uh, to, to the gentleman in the room and just say, I, I, if I were to peel any of this, would any of you be uh, telling huh? Ms. Atkins about that? It, not, not at all. Please I've do. Heard- Plenty of strange properties of smoke causing paper to peel back. It's, it is known. And then let's not 
the, the fact that the smoke, it's more like uh, like coal, not not the wood smoke, not the meat, not cigarettes, tobacco. It has got a very peculiar, like an uh, old, uh, old forge or... Now that you mentioned it, you're right. I remember one time I filmed a fight on top of a train and I got hit in the face with an oar. And I remember that smell right before I got knocked down. Mm. As you guys are saying that, I would say. The other thing you would notice as you're as you're kind of looking around, it's again, you're you're all within very close proximity of each other. It's not a big room. Think of like a dorm room, basically. Um and you can see that there (laughs) on some items around in here, furniture. Some of the like various you know uh, books and things he has. The, some of the the tops of the items have this thin layer of soot on them, mm. kind of kind of dusted off almost. That is worthwhile. Looking at the ceiling, is there any kind of burn or char marks? And what kind of pattern? You do notice as you look up, Grigori, that there are these dark sooty streaks that are moving across the ceiling. And it's going from like northwest to the southeast. So like a line or lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go from there, you look at where, if you're going to sit down a little toy train, where would you put it in the room? In that open spot right there. How is the ceiling, you know, is it low enough that I can touch the ceiling? Uh, There's a bed here, so you can easily climb up. That's, That's not a problem. Very well. I'll give you a piggyback ride if you need it. A boost would be amazing, yes. And I'll just wipe my finger across a suit on uh, the, yeah. the... And does it... Is it sooty as I expect? Yeah, pulls right off. While you're up here looking down, too, you also notice on the ground that kind of... It, it's not as easy to see because of the darkness mm-hmm. of the of the, car, of the carpet, but as you're looking up and down and you see the lines up there, you look down, look up, look down. There's also... That's the same kind of like these these smudges uh, along the carpet, like parallel, right? I'll point that also out running as well. northwest to the southeast. Um, if think... anybody would like, mm. roll an education test if you like. I can do that. I am very well educated. Pema, what do you think of this as well? So, what what is the? And so I'll, I'll sort of be um, walking. Wow, that's a roll. Um, I would good. like to be uh, walking sort of the the distance between kind of the one mark and the other mark to kind of gauge that like does this seem like the toy width or a sure. larger width? And as you're speaking that right out loud and you're saying that theory, Gregory, you take a look at what she's saying. Mm-hmm. They the width of the of those streaks they are the width train tracks apart, like full not, size not train toy tracks. Trains. Train tracks. Full sized. Yeah. Dear Lord, Pema, that is. They've, many trains have rode in across many countries. And yes, you are exactly right. That is the full width. How did they get the full train track in the room? And so Pema will go and like walk her steps to the d- doorway. And I'm assuming find that the doorway is more narrow than these uh the width yeah, of these tracks you would hmm that's actually a good question that i don't know the answer to i would say that there are you would imagine the doors are probably slightly narrower yeah. slightly narrower yeah. yeah if you would forgive a man for being very silly i would say this reminds me a lot of the speech we just heard last night about things appearing in gradual degrees All right. From one reality into another. Oh, shit. Dillian's just going to start looking for places that, like, you might put something overnight um, or that you don't want touched uh, immediately, like, um, if someone were to come in and do room service. so um, Like a footlocker or something. Yeah. He's going to start looking for... Sure. Um um, you know, anything that someone may have put away. Real spot hidden, if you like. So, I would say, as you're looking around, he, you know, there is, uh, like, a chest. It's not so much a, 
Like there, I actually someone said chest, but a dresser. Let's say like a, a, a kind of a tall, narrow dresser. A different hand, like maybe four or five drawers. I start going through those. You're looking for any places where someone might hide something, like beneath a pillow, or beneath a bed. Doesn't look like you found anything hidden. Like you don't really see anything, like any hiding spots. Um, I would say the one thing that kind of catches your attention uh, as you're. Uh, as you're looking around, is that you do actually see a receipt uh, in one of the drawers uh, that seems to be a, a receipt, like a handwritten receipt for the train. Uh, and it does sort of identify the shop. Uh, it's an antique shop in mm -hmm. uh, Islington uh, called the Crescent Treasury. Uh, and it was purchased a couple days ago, um, which aligns with the story that Smith gave you in terms of him being exuberant saying he just recovered something. So it's just sort of confirmation of what you've seen, but yeah, it's called the Crescent treasury. It's in, it's in Islington or Islington. He seems like he procured it. Is it procured the train from the Crescent? What was that? Crescent one? Uh, the Crescent treasury. The Crescent treasury. Oh, that's a, that's a amazing lead. We should definitely follow up on that forthwith. Absolutely. So, we see the tracks, right? And we see that. And the wallpaper you pointed out is blistering. The thing that can blister wallpaper like that is steam. And they've got a metric sheetload of books on dealing with trains. Uh, could I ask all of you to assist me in making a grand mess? And turning out all of the books. Turning out? I'll show it. I'll go pick up a book from a shelf. And I'll give it a shake, quick thumb through, put it back. Sure. You do all uh. this. Nothing, like like a couple of them stuff falls out. But when they fall, it's just like a sketch, like an engineering mm -hmm. schematic. You see stuff from the Orient Express. You see stuff from the Trans-Siberian Express, the Flying Scotsman. You see all sorts of different things. See designs on engines, designs on railway tracks. It really just seems this guy is like very, very into it. Uh, but nothing kind of falls out that seems suspicious in any particular way. Like all of it just seems like he's folding and tucking related information. So like a photograph of the Orient Express is tucked into like a history of the Orient Express, a photo of the Trans-Siberian, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. all kind of lines up but you, you managed to go through it all and, and nothing shakes free all that right. catches your eye is there any any flyers or pamphlets or anything in his room for that train spotting group sure yeah i mean you do i would say you do find that uh there's a, a the name arthur butter uh, is is seems to be the uh, the head of it uh he's so i would say you would probably have uh, like a newsletter, so you would see that in his in, in the drawer, where like you find the you know the receipt and a few other things. Uh, so it seems to be like an address, like to the headquarters to the Train Spotters Association. You look at it; it looks like a residential address. Like it likely could be like the headquarters is at someone's home. But yeah, you would have it. And the name Arthur Butter it, it seems to be associated with the with the group. So, uh, recalling something that I'm sure Gregory would, uh, Gregory would be if paid attention to, but Chuck was distracted by chat. Um, the two people that carried the heavy train upstairs, who were they? Was it the person who lives here and along with the other mer missing person? Yeah, yes. it was Stanley and Abernathy. Okay. That's just what I thought I heard. And for whatever reason, the authorities believed that one person could have disappeared in a puff of smoke, but two people could not have disappeared in the same puff of smoke. I mean, this is quite odd. Yeah, that is, I mean, really, if one person is going to spontaneously combust, what is the difference in two people spontaneously combusting, especially if they're in the same area? Maybe uh, Mr. Abernathy does not bring the same social clout that uh, Mr. Stanley does. Mm -hmm. Oh, my friends, what is next? It 
Well, we could always go to the treasury. That uh, that antique shop with the curiosity place. Yes. I'd agree. I got a funny feeling about this. I agree. I want to see where it goes. I'll probably regret it later. But not now. Now I want to know. Oh. Pema's going to go over to the books and she's like trying to remember where they were. And she's like, this woman is making enough money off of this disaster let us not have her charge us extra you do your your best and at this point like your your time is is running thin you hear the sounds of she's like kind of waddling up the stairs a bit in her in her slippers you can you can hear her coming so you're quickly starting to put stuff back and then the door swings open and you see her in her curlers but you can tell as she opens the door she's little makeup on actually (laughs) 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 Celian, this is all you, my friend. Uh, If you all wanted to stay longer, you're going to have to spend another sixpence. Leave you me, I would not mind it, of course. As her eyes kind of linger over on Celian. But more will come, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much for... um, Mm -hmm charging us to come see this room where where this happened you have a good day ma'am and Pamela yeah. will exit as you start exiting she does the classic kind of like puts her arm on the doorway as like Cillian comes up you know and she's like if there's anything else you need hmm. please just let me know <laughs> then she like maybe of, so and uh i i take out three more pence and i say I do realize, I just realized it was price per leg as I put those oh, in her hand shit. and walk off. <laughs> she takes it and she, she doesn't say anything at first. It doesn't register. You're down, uh, you're, you're about, you're all the way down the stairs and you hear from above, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> as the door opens up <laughs> when you leave the apartment. <laughs> oh, my friend Celia, I should have bring you on many more hunts. You would make Oh, oh, dealing with people so much easier. Well, it takes a certain type in order for it to work, but uh, it does work. I will say. <laughs> you, you do certainly have the skills to charm just about anyone that you I talk am charmed. to. I am very wooed. Well, um, it is why I was brought up. Uh, the, the story isn't necessarily happy, but I am taking advantage of it. Very well. Very well. We all make the best of what we get, or at least we try to. Yes. I was brought up to be an item. I was brought up to be an exotic item to be passed around Hmm. here in Europe. Well, I sympathize. I was brought up being told I was supposed to be a lot of things. So I ran away, turned myself into a big old dipshit for a lot of years. Stumbled into this instead. Yes. Yes. Well, you're from... I believe they call that the land of the free, free to be a dipshit. Indeed. I've been to America many times. So that is a great way to put it. I agree. My uh, Having been raised by folks that were not my natural born parents, I also understand what it's like to be raised to be a certain thing and I feel for you. My parents died when I was young. I was given many freedoms. I do feel for you in that. You too. That's strange. I never even knew my own parents. What a, what an unlikely bond we all share. Yes, it is. So the friendship through childhood trauma. It is a great day. Uh, yes, we'll bond over it. <laughs> I'll take any reason to drink in the morning. I. Well, at this point, out my it's bottle of vodka and just <laughs> carry a bottle of vodka. <laughs> then brush it away with a knot. Yeah, that's fair. I'm presuming you are having this conversation into wherever it is you're going next. You have a couple options. Yes. You've, you've got the, the shop. You've got the cops. You've got the um, the Train Spotters Association. Those three things probably stand out the most. Is Sounds there... like the majority interest was in the uh, the Crescent Treasury. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's yeah. Islington. That's okay. So you, you kind of start heading there. It's a little bit further away, uh, but you can get there uh, within 
not too long. Are these things on the map? Yeah, you can see that Islington's to the north there. Uh, there's a... Yeah, it's a bit to the north. Sort of north in the middle there. Um, so... Okay, so you head there, and you can see... I, I, you know, not to... Not to be a disappointing jerk, but as you get there, uh, it's... Uh, you notice... That is it closed? There is a closed sign on it. Uh, it's a brick shop, two stories, but you see a small closed sign resting. It's, it's like resting in the in the shop door's window. There are other shops nearby. Uh, all of them are open. Doesn't seem to be like a run of it, but for some reason, this specific one is closed. Is this the kind of building where the um, where the walls touch the walls of the building next to it? Uh, I think that sounds like that should be correct. So, no, we'll okay. say that there's an alleyway at least on one side. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I don't have a lot rattling around in here, but sometimes ideas, they collide with each other. Silly, you're so goddamn charming. What if we convince these people that we happen to know the people in the place that we just came from? They probably uh, had intended to purchase something, some sort of peculiarity from this shop. And, of course, shame that it is. You know, we've been sent here to procure it for the family or something. I don't know. I'm not great at coming up with these sort of things. But we talked to the shop nearby. Maybe they know the people in this shop. Maybe they know a way to get us over into there. Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, the deceased allegedly has family that's inconsolable. Or perhaps there is a simple answer as to why they're closed that the store next door might just be able to tell us. Yes. Maybe Pema has a much better idea than me. Uh I'll take a look kind of through the window and I mean, does it look like uh, there is like the, the slightest layer of dust, like it's been closed for a long time? No, I mean, you look inside okay. and you can see it's a pretty, I mean, it's an antique, you tell immediately this is an antique shop, right? Like you can mm -hmm. see like there's, there's a, a variety of different pieces, some of Egyptian, Arabic, you know, different make. You see brass works, rugs, ceramics, you know. Um, none of it looks like it's coated in dust or to suggest it's been empty for like a long period of time. Nothing like that. Of course, they would have things that did not belong to them. Um, well, maybe they are out for lunch. Yes, it could be. Is the sign... That says that they're closed. Is it just sort of? Does it seem like a a sign that was added in? You know, sort of like a handwritten sign, or does it seem like the regular open closed? It's the usual. I mean, it might be handwritten, but it's it doesn't look like it's hastily drawn. It looks to be like okay. something they probably use regularly. Okay. It's a two story. Yeah, it's a two story brick shop. So what's next door to the right? Yeah, you can see that to the right, uh, we'll say across from the alleyway, there's like a small grocer. Uh, so you see like some fresh vegetables or fruits, something simpler like that, like as fresh as can be anyway. Uh, and you can see like there's like a, a portly looking man, bald head. He's got pretty like, you know, bushy arms. Like you can see his forearms are pretty uh, pretty hairy. He's got his sleeves rolled up and an apron on. Hey, uh, what do you all uh what are you all doing over there at the old Turk shop? Ah, oh, yes, hello. My name's Cillian. What's your name? Hey, uh, you can call me, uh, you can call me, uh, Reggie. Hello, yeah, Reggie. Well, I heard tell that, uh, they have all sorts of things over there. And I, I'm from Sierra Leone myself. And I heard that there was something there from Sierra Leone. I was wondering if I could be procured. Remind me something from home. Um, where's Sierra Leone? Is that like you? It's a colony. Oh, is it? Is it now? Okay. Uh, well, I can't help you. He's, uh, I ain't here. I uh, closed up short a couple of days ago. A couple of days? Yeah, I suppose. Does he normally do this? Clothes up for days and leave? Is he, know, is he a, to be back? It's kind of a taciturn sort, kind of grumpy. Doesn't really talk mm. too much, old fella. Um, and so does this mention of a couple days, does it line up with the 
spontaneous combustion in any way, at least time frame. Uh, maybe. I mean, he's being pretty, like, he's being vague. With very the, vague. The, yeah, and, like, if you press him, he's like, um, I don't know, two, maybe. It doesn't seem like, I would say you are you guys probably have enough, uh, like, insight to, to sort of, he's not necessarily lying to you. He's just like, I don't pay that much attention. I got my own show to worry about. Oh. I really appreciate the information. Um... I, for the briefest of moments, was like, could I leave my number? And it, like, there's not really a really number. <laughs> it's just um, like your so, favorite number. Is a, is a yeah, yeah. You, you perhaps might have a calling card. It's true. Yeah. I understand. You're curious to, I know you had your heart set on something from Sierra Leone, but Reggie, I'd love to see what you have to sell there because I'm famished. No, you go, yeah, I can help you. Come on this way. Mm-hmm. And I'll do my best to kind of go over and just legitimately, like, Joseph Tidwell eats so much. He's got, yeah, it, it's it's a pretty stand, you know, it's pretty small, but standard grocer. You're not the only person in here. A couple aisles, crowded. Uh, are you a big guy? You're big, oh, you yeah. a big American? Is that, is that Yeah, it is? basically, I picture <laughs> Tidwell, like, basically think almost like Michael Chiklis, like bald, almost no hair, oh, yeah, like really right. broad shouldered. Okay. But with You're, like, yeah, he's a big dude too, but he's much shorter than you, uh, and so like he's a he's a little stocky in that regard, like a like a Dennis Franz kind of guy. And yeah, as you're like wandering through, like you're having a little trouble here and there, but there's plenty of food. Like there's like different kinds, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's, there's, gonna make sure that I wedge myself in tight, get in leaning close. I'm, I'm I'm a close talker, especially I've already done some day drinking. I've done some day drinking. <laughs> We're gonna do some snacking now. We gotta get in all close. And he's really obnoxious uh, American. And meanwhile. Hopefully, this obnoxious American can distract him from the other people. That's what it sounds like. Okay, so what are the other people doing? I will immediately, seeing our opportunity, move down the alley, looking at the back of the building for another way in, maybe. There is another door back here. You can also see that there are some windows in the second story that you could potentially uh, try to find a way up. So those are probably your two best bets. Uh, either would require a roll here. Uh, so if you're looking to get in the door, uh, it's kind of probably a locksmith test. If you're trying to pick mm. the lock or if you're just trying to force it open, you can do that too. Uh, if you're looking to try to get into the windows above, you can probably do a climb check uh, to try to get up there. Anybody have locksmith higher than a one? No, <laughs> I do not. Oh, dear. There was, <laughs> although I'm not a second story in myself, there's been plenty of times I've had to use the second story. Um, right so well. I'm going to try. I will help you and give you a lift. Okay. Uh, make the climb a little less. I, I'll I'll stand back and point out possible handhold <laughs> locations. All right. So how does, how does assistance work? Are you are, are you really helping him, uh, Gregory? Mm-hmm. Uh, of I'll tell you what, if you're, if you're there kind of giving him like a boost up, uh, roll the climb check. You take a, uh, say, take a bonus die in it. So, uh, so basically, you're rolling two two tens dies essentially, and you're taking okay. better mm, one ones day. All right, it should be in the system if you're rolling it in found. It is. I wasn't able to get there. It was four, uh, off. four, four will get you there if you want to spend four. Um, yeah, let's do that. Uh, okay. So how do I say I've done that? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, there it is. There's you click button. on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Uh, all right, so yeah, you climb up, you push a window open pretty easily, and you kind of tumble inside. Uh, no problem. It's uh, actually doesn't appear to be locked or anything up here. It's the second story, and it it's very clearly a living space. Uh, you can see, you know, bed, dresser, etc. Um, things are fairly tidy. Uh, you can tell, uh, but um, you don't really. Interestingly enough, as you're kind of moving around, you don't really see any kind of like. There's like no bookshelves with books the way there was in, in like Stanley's or anything like that. But you see like a kind of a stripped down bedroom uh, in living quarters. I'm not going to take too much time as I don't want them to be out in the alleyway for too long. So I'm okay. going to go downstairs to that side door and um, unlock it for them. Okay. Yeah. You hu- yeah you hustle down uh, and you go through the actual shop itself. Uh, and you are able to find the door. You pop it open. Pema and, and Gregory are able to go inside. Yes. And 
And inside, you guys, I mean, you see on the, the main floor, the bottom floor is the shop. The top floor seems to be where whoever owns this shop lives. Uh, and you can tell that it, it very much is an antique shop. You could probably tell stuff that looks legit, stuff that looks probably like, you know, reproductions or fake here or there. Uh, there's definitely a, a counter behind which seems to be a kind of a, not necessarily an office, but a small nook uh, where it looks like, you know, records are kept you know, ledgers and things like that for sales and such. Uh, and then the top, it's just, uh, it's just sort of a living space. Um, uh, yeah, I want to immediately, I mean, of course we are breaking the entering here. So I want to be try as, as stealthy, low profile as the man, my stature can be, but my focus is on trains. Trains is the name of the game. Okay. Anything, uh, antiques, books, personal sure. notes. Uh, I'll say all of you can go ahead and roll maybe a spot hidden or something like that as you're rolling. I like, hey, like you're stealthy now, but outside as you guys are breaking in, <laughs> no stealth there. Really, this that's no. a bold. That's a bold, bold choice, Cotton. Let's see how that, uh, <laughs> yeah. let's see how that plays out. Uh, success for Pema. Oh, okay. hard failure. Hard failure. You knock something over, and it shatters yeah. on the ground. So I don't know if that's hard failure. It's it's not hard. Nah. Guys. There's a critical. It's thing. not a fumble. It's yeah. not, it's not a fumble. fumble. Okay. You're fine. Uh, so okay. Uh, Celine, did you roll as well? Yeah, I did not pass. Okay. Uh, was anyone looking for um, any like like I know Gregoria was looking for the trains. Was anyone else looking Pema's, for anything in particular? Or Pema's looking for uh, a diary, an appointment book. Uh, yeah, a calendar yeah, for or something sure. like that. There's definitely some account books that you can tell uh, on the bottom floor. So I'll say, Grigori, you you're looking around. You, I would say you you probably notice what looks like um, kind of a, a model, like a very intricate model reproduction of like the Orient Express, but it doesn't look to be like a like a play model to put on like a mm -hmm. track. It just right. more just looks like a brass display. Aside from that, I would say you don't notice anything uh, toy wise that would that would sort of be consistent Sorry. with what you found before. My my biggest, the uh, most inspection I would give that model is just to plop pinky right in smokestack. See if I don't imagine it looks far too nice to actually contain. But, Cold, cool, like, yeah. like it would you would expect it to be yeah. like brass. Yeah. Uh, Pema, you you're looking around. You find some account books, records. They're shelved underneath the counter uh, on the on the bottom floor. Uh, I would say if you start flipping through it. Um, you can see um, if you want. I, I'll say if you want, you can roll an accounting test. Actually, do you have accounting? <laughs> I've got five. Yeah, you don't. I mean, like it just it might give you some more specific. Five is enough. I mean, well, you roll. yeah, yeah. No, I rolled a forty-six. <laughs> okay. Do you want to spend forty-one points of luck? Do you want to push? Don't I don't even push have here. forty-one points of luck even to start. I did not roll as well as Mr. Tidwell did with my uh, five. <laughs> so, okay. So what that. I'll, what I'll say is like, you can very easily see that like there's uh, things seem as far as you can tell, like you're not an accountant and, and you're not necessarily sure what to look for, but as far as you can sell, like most of like the purchases and such, most of the goods that the, whoever runs this shop, looks to be imported from Turkey or the Middle East or they're bought from various like London auction houses. Um, there, I would say you do notice uh, one, one piece uh, in, in the ledger. Um, again, you can't like the, the math. It's not really probably your, your strong suit, the accounting math, I should say. Um, but you don't notice, I would say, in, in consistent with Grigori, like there's nothing here to suggest that there are other trains, toys ever listed anywhere on this in this ledger. So like you're going back through, you're going back through, you're looking for anything. You do find like there was the purchase of this train set, and it says on the on like on a, this assignment note, it says one Wrightson Special Commission train set, and it was purchased specifically from the the estate of Randolph Alexis several months ago. So you do you do find that. But that's literally the only, like, train, toy, anything like that that's listed. 
everything else here is is like like they're for antique display like there's no children's toys or anything like that like that's a it's kind of a peculiar item consistent with the, everything else silly and so no go ahead good ahead. if you have follow-up go ahead no, I was just going to share with everyone that this that that was the train from the Alexis family. This, this one right, right here. Uh, no, the the one that was purchased. Oh. Mm. So, so where is train now? Well, you guys know that the the cops took it. Oh, okay. I did not. Yeah. I missed that. Yes. Yep. It's oh, in it's... evidence. Oh, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> well, perhaps, uh, <laughs> perhaps since we have an actor among us, he could act like an American policeman. Oh, that is true. That's some good news for you guys, sheriffs. Oh, I some, I have some really good news for you guys. As you're talking about this, like about this. trying to access how we're going to get this. Speaking Silly, of police, you look mm-hmm. out the window. And you notice that a woman from across the street had like she comes out and she meets what looks to be just a a, a policeman walking down the street and she kind of flags him down and you can see she's pointing at the shop that you guys are currently in up to the second story and like in the shop and stuff and at that point <laughs> he he kind of starts walking towards you guys walking towards the front of the store and and from a distance starting to try to peer in the oh. windows and we we'll stop there. We'll, we'll stop <laughs> oh, right there. Oh, okay. oh my gosh. We're right there. We'll stop. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the right. police station came to us. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had a Keystone Cops precinct. reference ready. <laughs> oh, did you? I'm sorry. No, it's good. Okay. All Just remember right. it two weeks from now. I For will. sure. For sure. I looked up a lot of old-timey movie stuff. Oh, did you? Hmm. Dude, your voice. Yeah. Yeah, I know you were worried about your voice, but I thought it worked out pretty well. It looks good. It did. Yeah, it was it was great. <laughs> we uh, started. I can't believe we finally started. Yeah, on finally. Right? And I killed Matt's character before he even got to play him. You uh, did. Yeah. I just burned him alive. Spontaneous. He's missing combustion. an arm. I mean, you do what you got to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, I heard the name. I was like, wait a minute. Wait mm-hmm. one second. That'll learn you guys. This is a session. <laughs> I'll kill I'll you miss quick. a session. Oh, is uh, Double D still alive? Double D is still alive, uh, but is married. Uh, we uh, we married him off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To one it of the witches. <laughs> okay. All right. He's you or me, man. <laughs> okay. So uh, some closing closing plugs. Uh, first session that was fun. Thanks for bearing with me through the lecture. I knew that was going to be rough. Like it's, it's a lengthy lecture, but it is what it is. I had another idea for how I wanted to start, but I decided against it when I saw the length of it because I was going to do this other thing. I'll tell you guys about it later, but like I was pretty excited for it. And I'm like, no, because that would just be me talking for like 30 minutes and that's it. And that's be awful. We will uh, put up some dead wife comments. <laughs> oh yeah i know right just talking about i'm your dead wife oh goodness oh my gosh but he does have one. Oh no don't do that to him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right <laughs> oh dear just missed. uh all right let's do some closing plugs uh jeremy tell us about this patreon yeah when we saw patreon comics maps tokens rpg assets why not check it out perfect uh, link is in the chat. If you're catching this later on YouTube, check the description. Uh, I'll have all the links there as well. Chuck, what's going on with Defenders? Oh, yeah. Uh, Defenders of Cobalt, twitch.tv slash Defenders of Cobalt. Every Wednesday, we've got our alien campaign, all fear the Ishtar. Uh, Jeremy and Jeff are in that. It's a lot of fun. We're playing Space Pirates now, right now. It's fantastic. Uh, Fridays, we are doing Heart. Um, Joe's running that. Also very entertaining. Uh, every other Saturday, we are on Goodman Games Official. Bert runs us through some weird frontiers. Uh, Jeremy and I hang out for that. Um, and yesterday, Sunday, uh, John from Defenders of Cobalt uh, just ran our first Pathfinder 2nd Edition session for Age of Ashes, where we're all playing goblins. We're calling it Oops All Goblins. Uh, and those episodes will be coming out YouTube only. Steven is in it. My Trey's in it. 
uh, April, myself, um, those are going out. If you, Steven is just cobalt energy or I'm sorry, goblin energy all the fucking time. Uh, so he does exactly what you expect and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and that'll be hitting YouTube next week, I think. Awesome. Uh, and then Adam, tell us about Grim Perilous. Yeah, go to www.grimandperilous.com. Um, you'll stay up to date on all the things that we have going on with us. From there, you can find all sorts of social links, um, depending on which social media platform you use. Um, if you keep an eye on the website thing, I've been saying that eventually I'll get around to. I just need to go through the picture, go through the trouble of taking a picture of it and making a page for it. We're soon going to be selling the few uh, uh, Mangosh, yeah, uh, Dan Mandich exclusive covers uh, that uh, um, we have left over from the Kickstarter years and years ago. Um, so if you're wanting one of those, um, st- uh, just take a look at the website every now and then. Well, we should have that up here within the month. Very cool. uh, Yeah. Nice. Uh, as for us here at the Lollygaggers, uh, our next of uh, our next stream is Friday. Uh, we we are concluding, or it's the finale of season one, I guess we can call it, of Hunter the Reckoning. We've been doing a chronicle for a couple months now. Your city lies in dust. Uh, so season one finale coming on Friday. Very crazy cliffhanger we left off on. Saturday, we're doing some One Ring, second edition, uh, as we always do. Uh, Monday next week is Call of Cthulhu is going to be in every other uh, every other week. Uh, in the opposite weeks, we're going to be playing Holler for Savage World, so come hang out with us then. Uh, also, we just started up a Blade Runner campaign this past weekend. It's over on YouTube right now. Uh, a lot of fun, so check that out. And in a few weeks, uh, our buddy Steven, who Chuck mentioned, is going to be running some Forbidden Lands uh, on the channel as well. So lots of cool stuff coming. Thanks for everyone who hung out tonight. Thanks for those of you who are watching this later on VOD or on YouTube. Thank you for the players for hanging out and uh, enduring this. Uh, and uh, I'm just so happy we finally got to start this. Is this right? has been this has been we've been cooking this for like like I think three months, three and a half months. October or so was when we ended Deadlands, and then like. And then finally, we're back to like an actual campaign and not just doing like random stuff. So very, very excited to get into this. We have a long, long, long way to go, uh, but I'm really excited for where we're going to go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and raid uh, our buddies over at Happy Jacks RPG. So hit that raid button when it pops up. Say hi to them. Follow them. Follow us. Follow all these wonderful people. Have a great week. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.